Hey, welcome back to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about how Echo and the Bunnymen saved British rock. Well, 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 we've got Genesis, got a little Stevie Winwood, got Eric Clapton. What more do you want? How's the Empire going to maintain control with that bureaucracy? Dude, that's from Star Wars. Blimey. Thank you for joining me on this journey as I tried to explain how Echo and the Bunny Men saved British rock. It may be silly in retrospect to think of a time when people were talking about the death of rock, but back in the early 80s when bands like the Human League and ABC and Culture Club were hitting the charts with regularity, people would talk about the death of rock. Synth pop was king. People thought it was the end of new music being made with guitars. The 60s and 70s dinosaurs are always going to be out there playing. But new people making music with guitars was becoming a thing of the past. And all the British weeklies were always running articles about the death of rock. Here are some of the number one singles on the UK charts for 1980. Another Brick in the Wall by Pink Floyd. Hey, Roger Waters, leave them kids alone. Coward of the County by Kenny Rogers. Kick that shit, shit kicker. Xanadu by Olivia Newton-John. Love Olivia Newton-John. And the theme from M.A.S.H. Suicide is not painless when you have to listen to it. Everyone expected post-punk to save rock. Susie and the Banshees started morphing more into goth. Public Image Limited started turning into more of a straight up new wave band. Magazine and Gary Newman continued getting more and more electronic as did Wire, and then suddenly there's a huge wave of new pop bands. So there was the Human League, there was ABC, there was Orange Juice, everybody had a light, poppier sound. Many British rock fans were pinning their hopes for the future on Joy Division. When lead singer Ian Curtis committed suicide, Joy Division left a huge gaping hole in post-punk. There were two bands who were going after Joy Division's audience. One was Echo and the Bunnymen from Liverpool. Two was this little band from Ireland called U2. It may be hard to believe now with what U2 has become, but they were actually a little tiny post-punk band trying to make it. A little something to know about Echo and the Bunnymen, or at least lead singer Ian McCulloch. He hated U2, and he would say it every chance he got. Echo and the Bunnymen came out of Liverpool. Echo and the Bunnymen lead singer Ian McCulloch was in a band with Julian Cope, leader of the Teardrop Explodes. Julian Cope kicked Ian McCulloch out of the band and formed the Teardrop Explodes, and Ian McCulloch eventually recruited Will Sargent on guitar, Les Pattinson on bass, and a drum machine, which didn't have a name. This early version of the group put out one single, 4,000 copies of The Pictures on My Wall. That song had a real acoustic flair to it, and this early version of the song is very Velvet Underground-like, which was a major inspiration for the group. The band found a great drummer, Pete DeFreitas, just in time to record their debut album in 1980, Crocodiles. This was released on July 18th, the same exact day that Closer by Joy Division was released. The lead song, Going Up, announces the arrival of one of the most romantic voices in post-punk. Ian shows off both sides of his range and the rhythm section was seldom funkier. Will is all over the place on guitar. There's twang, there's tremolo, there are little accents. Going up really perfectly sets up the sonic template for this album. The second track here on the US version is Do It Clean. Do It Clean is to me their first truly great song. It's a rocker, it's got an interesting structure, but everything the band does well is totally realized on that track. And it's such a forward-thinking song for them, which is why it fits in so nicely with their later work. Incidentally, Do It Clean is one of two extra tracks here on this U.S. version. The other is Read It In Books. Stars Are Stars. It's very moody, with a sneaky, insidious bass part, with a guitar pattern on top that is so simple yet so perfect. The next song on here, Pride, very early killing joke. And then Ian's voice comes in, and suddenly it's sexy. The lyrics implore you to do it. Do it. Do it. Done. 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 The song Monkeys features one of Will's best guitar parts. He doesn't play anything that calls attention to himself. He serves the song, which is why I think Will Sargent is always criminally underrated as a guitarist. Every Echo in the Bunnymen album has these beautiful accents and flourishes and little touches. If Will Sargent were an NBA player, he would have been Charles Oakley. Leading the league in intangibles. That's not a thing. 
Crocodiles is an up-tempo rocker that proves that the Bunnymen could play at breakneck speed without losing their signature sound. It's got some of Pete DeFreitas' best moments on drums, and Will Sargent's guitar work on that track is very Andy Gill, Gang of Four. The song Rescue was the second single released off this album, and from the opening notes, it sounds like a hit. The verses are forceful and a bit off kilter, and the chorus is plaintive and endearing, and the whole damn thing is just irresistible. It's also got that early Beatles thing, where they have the charismatic lead singer say something directly to you. Won't you come on down to my rescue? Won't you? With the big, sexy, pouty lips. Come on. That's rock and roll. The song Villiers Terrace is a personal favorite. They've been playing it since they first got together. Depending on who you ask, it's either a drug song or it's a song about Adolf Hitler rolling around on the carpet, giddy at his acquisition of Czechoslovakia. Either way, it's a beautifully obscure gem of a song. The song Pictures on My Wall is a re-recording of their initial single when it was known as The Pictures on My Wall. This version of Pictures on My Wall is my favorite song on the album. It is a gloomy masterpiece, and the song really comes alive thanks to drummer Pete DeFreitas. If you're thinking of checking this album out, I highly recommend Villiers Terrace and Pictures on My Wall. There are two non-hits that are just phenomenal examples of Echo and the Bunnymen's sound. This album is moody and dark and introspective, like the best of post-punk, but make no mistake, this is a rock album. This is a rock band, and rock was in good hands with Echo and the Bunnymen. This album is very much influenced by the Velvet Underground, by The Doors, and by television. And those three bands would loom large in Echo and the Bunnymen's careers, sound-wise. In May of 1981, the band release, Heaven Up Here. This was produced by Hugh Jones. Hugh Jones had already produced Adam and the Ants, Kings of the Wild Frontier, as well as the Teardrop Explodes, Kilimanjaro, and two Simple Minds albums. Album opener, Show of Strength, lets you know that they're going for a much bigger more experimental sound on this album. With a Hip is a relentless death dance of a number. Bassist Les Pattinson really drives this track. Over the Wall, which was the second single off this, and It Was a Pleasure are both great tracks, and they continue the tense atmosphere that this album creates. A Promise was the first single off this album, and it is a classic signature Echo in the Bunnymen tune. I believe it's about a breakup of some kind, a broken promise. You said something will change, but something will change. You said nothing will change, but nothing will change. You trifling mother. Breakup, right? Relationships are hard. There is water imagery in the fade out. Light on the waves, light on the water. We could sail on forever. Very much in keeping with the theme here. That's something about the covers. They're a very elemental band. They're big on imagery and the elements. It was part of that big sound movement that the Water Boys did, Hole of the Moon, that Big Country did, In a Big Country, Fields of Fire. Everything was elemental. Everything was about the earth and the atmosphere. And you get that in spades on this album. The fade out of this song has a little counter melody that is very similar to my ear of The Cutter, which will be on a later album. So I wonder if it got its origin here. I don't know for a fact. Ian won't answer my calls. A song like The Promise, that's how you end a side of an album. Side two begins with the title track, Heaven Up Here. And it is their Roadhouse Blues. Yeah, I went there. Come at me, bro. It features beer, whiskey, and tequila. And they're so damn drunk we can't see to steer. These are air quotes. The Disease is a quiet little track. It references heaven, just like the title track before it. The Disease, it turns out, is his life. It's not an uplifting track, but it's still a sweet little change of pace musically on the album. Speaking of sweet musicality, All My Colors... All My Colors may be the most beautiful track on this album. Some people first heard it on the great 1981 EP, Shine So Hard. At that time, it was called Zimbo. It's got wonderfully obscure lyrics. I don't know what they're about. I think it's some Brit stuff. It's about, like, the independence of Rhodesia or something. I don't know. I'm not in the band. Not anymore. That's one of the things I love about this band. I'm never sure what the songs are about. If you need the songs to march up Fifth Avenue, Pride in the name of love, one man in the name of love, be that way. I never tire of Echo and the Bunnymen lyrics because they're so wonderfully obscure. No Dark Things is a moody, groovy little track that actually has very positive lyrics. I think it's a declaration of their ethos. They're a post-punk band, but they have no dark things. All I want is another big, epic song that is a great way to close this album. And it brings the curtain down on a big leap forward for the band. No sophomore slump here. In February of 1983, the band release, 
Porcupine. This is the third full length from the band, and for some reason it's much maligned. People view this as some sort of junior slump. It is not. It's delicious. Produced by Ian Brody, same mind behind the lightning seeds. From the first strains of the opening track, The Cutter, you can tell the band made a quantum leap in sound. There are strings. Great Eastern flavored strings, courtesy of Shankar. Shankar is a magnificent jazz artist. His first album was produced by Frank Zappa. He's brilliant. The drums are way up high in the mix, and the entire song is built around Ian's beautiful baritone voice. Almost the same way that Phantasmagoria, that whole album, was built around Dave Vanian's voice. At the end of the day, I think the cutter is about masturbation. Conquering myself again, not just another drop in the ocean. Full disclosure, I think most songs are about masturbation, but I'm usually right. The entire song is big. It's massive. It's almost U2 level production. And again, there's sailing, there's water imagery, and again, there's that pleading to the fans, say we can, say we will. What little teeny bopper doesn't want some of that? Echo and the Bunnymen's use of imagery in their songs is masterful. The Cutter was the second single off this album. It ended up going up to number eight on the UK charts, and it is a classic song. Speaking of classic songs, it's followed by The Back of Love, another brilliant rocker with Ace Production. I love a good one-two punch to open an album. The urgent drumming and the cello strumming just drive that entire song to the chorus's climax. There's a lot going on, but it maintains great separation. And then when you get to the bridge, there's a sort of psych breakdown that is a murky delight. It's filled with lots of echo. There's some weird production things going on there. And the whole song you think is falling apart, and then it just comes roaring back. The Back of Love was the first single off the album, and it made it to number 19. But those two solid tracks just blast Porcupine right out of your speakers. My White Devil is a brilliant change of pace. It's a mid-tempo gem that just might be my favorite track on the album. Why, yes, that is a marimba that you hear. The whole track is such gothic beauty. This album sounds like it was made outside. It sounds like it was made where they are. Incidentally, all of these album covers are by Brian Griffin. He's responsible for giving them this wonderful elemental look. So even if all you like is the first two hits off this album, I implore you to listen to My White Devil. It's a Hollis heat seeker. It's a Hollis hot tip. One of those. Porcupine, the title track, has a Middle Eastern flavor, again courtesy of Shankar, and it features a truly haunting vocal from Ian. The track just gets better and better and better as it goes along. Gods Will Be Gods is very psychedelic, with trippy backwards guitars. It's got a few Indian touches right out of Baba O'Reilly. The final track in Bluer Skies leaves the album on a positive note. I'm walking out from blackened skies. I've found myself in bluer skies. It's got modern production. It almost sounds like a drum machine. It's a nice, bright, glossy finish for the album. I really don't understand why this album is so maligned. In retrospect, it's better than most albums out at the time. This is their Pinkerton. Whereas a lot of post-punk bands offered a bleak worldview, Echo and the Bunnymen simply asked bleak questions. Will we evolve? Can it keep me from falling apart? Their lyrics were a gift to post-punk fans who felt left behind by the bleak worldview and dead-end street of Joy Division and the new pop bands who have foregone real rock and roll for glossy MTV videos and easy money. Not all of Echo and the Bunnymen's best songs were on albums. In February of 1984, the band dropped the Echo and the Bunnymen EP, aka the Sound of Echo EP, aka the Never Stop EP. <sighs> I'm exhausted. Never Stop is a brilliant song. It's a rocker. You can play it with an orchestra and it sounds amazing. It speeds up, it slows down, it's on slow boil for a while, it explodes. It's got it all. It also features three more songs from Crocodiles and Porcupine, plus an exceptional version of Do It Clean that they did live at Royal Albert Hall. In May of 1984, the band released Ocean Rain, another beautiful cover, courtesy of Brian Griffin. No, not that Brian Griffin. This LP kicks off with perhaps their prettiest song ever, Silver. How pretty is it? It's so pretty that Ian can't resist singing along with his own song. La la la. It's followed by Nocturnal Me. You may know it from the end credits of Stranger Things, Season 1, Episode 5, The Flea and Acrobat. Nocturnal Me sounds like the kind of song Dracula would sing to his lady, or ladies. Dracula had them all. He is a super hoe. My absolute favorite track on the album is probably the Yo-Yo Man. Hearing Ian's beautiful voice sing the lyrics 
Cold is the wind that blows through my headstone. And he sings it in the sing-songy way that's just tragic beauty. I'm turned on right now. Crown of Thorns is an angular stomper with some really, really odd lyrics. Can you name another post-punk song that references cucumber, cabbage, and cauliflower? Somewhere Sid Barrett is very proud. Side two of Ocean Rain is my side. It kicks off with the Bunny Men's masterpiece, The Killing Moon. It also happens to be one of the greatest songs ever made. Statement, not a question. Killing Moon finally puts together all of the skills, tones, and textures they've been playing with for years. Again, the use of strings elevates the song to gothic romantic heights. Just like the best of Echo and the Bunnymen's work, the lyrics are specific yet ambiguous. It's a love song. It's a death song. It's not about masturbation. It's a big sound. Ian's voice is way up in the mix, and there's a bassy rumble of strings underneath it all. It's a perfect statement of what makes Echo and the Bunnymen such a great band. Only made it to number nine on the UK charts. The number one record on the charts at that time? Pipes of Peace by Paul McCartney. Now I don't want to tell people how to live, but your priorities are way fucking out of whack if you're making that the number one. Just to give you an idea of what The Killing Moon was up against, here are the UK number one songs in order. Pipes of Peace, Paul McCartney, Relax, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, 99 Luff Balloons by Nina, and Hello by Lionel Richie. No 1980s normals were going to a record store looking for anything with lyrics that weren't walking up Fifth Avenue, let alone a cryptic gothic murder ballad with classical undertones. Hello, is it me you're looking for? Seven Seas, another great song. The boys are back on the water. It's a very wet album. I'm getting wet just talking about it. The lyrics to Seven Seas are surreal, but they work perfectly with the music. If you don't melt every time Ian pronounces the word tortoise, you may be a monster. Monster. The song My Kingdom gets overshadowed on that side. It's one of my all-time favorite Echo and the Bunnymen songs. Once that guitar comes in, it's oh so sweet. It's one of their great underappreciated songs. The lyrics on My Kingdom are exceptional, even by Echo and the Bunnymen standards. You kill when you talk and the enemy weakens. Your words start to walk when you're not even speaking. If my heart is a war, its soldiers are bleeding. If my heart is a war, its soldiers are dead. What? It's everything I want from a song. The title track, Ocean Rain, is an epic sweeping track with Baroque touches, and it really perfectly beds down this album. Ocean Rain is great here, but it truly comes alive in a concert setting. There's a bootleg I have of them at this club, The Karen, in Sweden, and it's a transcendent version. Of all the albums I'm talking about today, if you only listen to one side of one of these albums, just put on side two of Ocean Rain and let the whole thing play. If that does not make you an Echo and the Bunnymen fan, you will not be an Echo and the Bunnymen fan. And that's fine. Not everybody likes me. I don't like some people. I'm sure you too is installing a track on your iPhone right now. In 1985, the band released a new song, Bring on the Dancing Horses, on this best of songs to learn and sing. For those who only want a toe in the water, this compilation is yet to be bested. It's got everything you need on here, all of their best songs from all of their albums, including non-LP track Never Stop, and the brand new track Bring on the Dancing Horses, which is exceptional. The song was recorded for use in the film Pretty in Pink, and it would later come out on that film's soundtrack in January of 1986. This is a great soundtrack. Bands like Echo and the Bunnymen, The Smiths, Psychedelic Furs, OMD, you're gonna want this. In July of 1987, the band dropped Echo and the Bunnymen. This self-titled album came out three years after their previous one. The album was delayed due to excessive use of alcohol and petty jealousies and infighting among the members. You know, the usual band stuff. This album has a close-up. Let me introduce Ian McCulloch, Pete DeFridis on drums, Les Pattinson on bass, and Will Sargent on guitars. Poor Will. You know, Will is a sweetheart, I had the pleasure of DJing with him at an Echo and the Bunnymen after party at Beauty Bar in New York, one of the best bars in New York. That was the flyer from the night. He was a real sweetheart. But just take a look. I mean, can you imagine what it's like to be in a band full of like male models? You're just, you know, Joe Regular. I can relate to Will Sargent. I think we're all Will Sargent. Am I right? Why is everyone else so damn pretty? After Ocean Rain, drummer Pete DeFridis quit, but he came back into the fold for this album. The other band members didn't really trust his commitment 
and so they wouldn't make him a full-fledged member again, or rather a drummer for hire. The opening track, The Game, was an odd choice, I felt, for a lead-off single and to open the album. Over You, however, is the echo in the bunny man you've grown to love. It's a big, bright track with keyboards where they used to have strings, and get used to that. Because it was the 80s, baby, and keyboards were king. There are some touches on this album that almost seem Tears for Fears-like. And who doesn't like Tears for Fears? The song Bed Bugs and Ballyhoo is a bit of wish fulfillment for the band. Because guess who plays keyboards on that track? No less than Ray Manzarek from The Doors. And it is a Ray Manzarek organ if I ever heard one. If you know The Doors at all, it's almost a sexy, laid-back peace frog. It's that kind of funky. It's a catchy, seductive track. It was the third single from the album. It came out as a 12-inch here in America. There's the single of Bed Bugs and Ballyhoo, and then there's the 12-inch remix. But the B-side has three covers of songs that the band really loves. It's got Run 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 by The Velvet Underground, Paint It Black by The Rolling Stones, and Friction by Television. Ian kind of jokes his way through the vocal of Paint It Black, but Run 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 by their beloved Velvet Underground and Friction by Television. They do stellar versions of, and you can tell from those covers just how much they got from those two bands. Bomber's Bay is a very sweet song that may be my favorite use of keyboards on this album. Lips Like Sugar kicks off side two, and it is an excellent track. It is an attempt at making what Ian McCulloch called kissing music, and it was a master stroke. You got big pouty lips like this on your front man, you're gonna want a song that draws attention to them. Came out here in the US on a 12 inch with a few remixes. The 12 inch remix is my favorite. It lends itself to that length and you will not get tired of it. It also features a B-side, Roller Coaster, which was recorded for the album, but left off at the last minute. It's a fun, spooky track with great organ and a really uninhibited vocal from Ian. The UK 12 inch, featured a cover of The Doors People Are Strange, which would later be used in the movie The Lost Boys. New Direction is my favorite deep cut off this album. It's got a beautiful melody, interesting song construction, and very, very religious lyrics. I like it anyway. Dominus Vobiscum, motherfucker. Satellite is a fun little rocker that reminds you these boys grew up on fast, hard music. All My Life is a bit anticlimactic as a closer for an album this lush and epic, but we can forgive them anything after an album this good. This album was not critically acclaimed. Critics found it pretty, but empty. We Know Better, a year after this came out, 1988, Ian McCulloch quit the band. Shortly thereafter, drummer Pete DeFridis was killed in a motorcycle accident, so this would be a fond farewell for the classic era of Echo and the Bunnymen. The Bunnymen have since reformed several times. I saw them in, I believe, 2014 at Irving Plaza in New York. At least I think it was them. They played with about 47 smoke machines. All I could see were silhouettes. They were amazing. And Ian's voice, oh my god. When singers get older, it's kind of a crapshoot because they've aged and so have their vocal cords and they've done lots of things to their vocal cords. Ian still sounded amazing. There's a lot of Doors love. They did their version of People Are Strange and then later in the show they played Villiers Terrace and in the middle they did snippets of Roadhouse Blues and L.A. Woman but they had redubbed it New York Lady just for the occasion. They were phenomenal live, especially in a club that small. And I'm so glad I got to see them. So that is it. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please hit the subscribe button. And I will see you next week with a lot more cool stuff.